Thank you to David Parks for organizing this panel and seeing it through the transition to our remote presentation. And thank you to my esteemed co-panelists. I'm sorry that we don't get to have this conversation in person. Since 2009, I've been part of a feminist DIY movement in online publishing, spurred by new technologies and the belief that by seizing the means of production, we could transform the peer review process and publish feminist media scholarship in an open access format. Those efforts led to the founding of the FemBot Project in its open access journal, ADA, a journal of gender, new media, and technology. Published on a WordPress site until 2018, ADA just last month launched its 16th issue on the University of Minnesota's Manifold platform. I stepped away from FemBot in 2018 to focus on Reanimate a new project with Rupa Garism, an intersectional feminist publishing collective that produces multimodal digital editions of archival writing by activist women in the US media in the 1930s and 1940s. These are modest exercises in open access conducted from the margins of academic publishing with few resources, but a deep commitment to democratizing access to the materials we produce and allowing authors to control their published works. To move on to the specific questions this session addresses, in light of the current crisis, it's difficult to imagine a transition from where we are now to more widespread open access in academe. Having spent the last two months as an administrator planning for various scenarios for the coming year, I know that regardless of which scenario prevails, universities and academic publishing are going to come out on the other side of this pandemic as very different institutions. Still, Crises are moments of opportunity. Although the forces intent on destroying public education in the US are powerful, there may be cracks and fissures that, however painfully, open up new possibilities for open access publishing. For example, the monopoly that information analytics businesses like Elsevier and other multinational corporations currently hold over journal articles and databases may of necessity be further eroded as universities are less able to afford their services. In addition, progressive scholars, tired of having their work appropriated by car corporate publishers, locked up behind paywalls and sold for exorbitant prices back to the public institutions that funded much of that research in the first place, may organize themselves and engage in more direct collective campaigns of protest, like posting their materials on their own or university websites. Many have already been doing this. Or they may take advantage of new publishing platforms like Manifold and MIT's PubPub to publish books and journals. Keeping in mind the rising generation of diverse students in the United States and some state mandated multicultural curriculum requirements, this may also be an opportunity to devise ways to provide free accessible resources for our colleagues in secondary education for whom multicultural materials have long been too expensive or difficult to access because of the control conservatives exercise over the textbook publishing industry. In terms of ICA's role in the world of open access, perhaps associations like ICA could take more of a leadership role in helping administrators and faculty better understand and communicate about new metrics for impact. We need better guidance about existing and emerging forms of impact across the interdisciplinary fields of communications. Many review committees, for example, now look at Google Scholar, but that's not a great way of measuring impact in book-reliant disciplines. Thinking about page views and inclusion of text on syllabi provide different insights about impact than citations do. A book might only have 178 citations, but the fact that it's being taught in twice as many classes provides a different view of impact, and encouraging faculty to put their syllabi on open syllabus would help us track this. As for who will pay for open access, I'll just mention one idea we had been toying with before the crisis. Given the entrepreneurialization of so much academic publishing, Reanimate was considering developing a crowdfunded model for republishing or publishing new materials. Interest in the kinds of materials we're working with is increasing, and since we're publishing discrete projects rather than journals, we discussed charging a subscription fee until we had covered the cost of producing a given publication plus a percentage for reinvestment and archiving. After we met that goal, the publication would go open access. The university presses we talked to were intrigued by this idea. Some even had ideas of their own about how it might be operationalized using technologies drawn from the development side of university operations. 
I'm not sure how realistic this, this idea will be in light of current economic realities. I'll briefly conclude by focusing on challenges specific to the work we're doing at Reanimate, where our goal is to make unpublished or underpublished writings by women and people of color available as a way of addressing their absence from the historical record, as well as traditional anthologies and journals. One challenge for us is copyright, both for traditional journals and archival materials, and I'll give you some quick examples. Reanimate wanted to publish for the first time a novel by an African-American author who's not particularly well known. The novel is about Anne Newport Royal, an abolitionist and one of the first women journalists in US history. We offered to scan it, transcribe it, to have a qualified scholar determine which of three versions was a definitive one, et cetera. But the person who owns the copyright believes that the novel might one day generate profit for the copyright owner who has no relationship to the original author and so refused our request. In another case, a private archive has proved reluctant to give us permission to publish the writings of a prominent woman in broadcasting. I suspect because the institution is Jesuit and the broadcaster in question was part of a network of lesbian women in broadcasting. My third example, The Ghost Reader, is a compilation that rethinks the intellectual history of media studies by republishing, publishing for the first time, or publishing articles in conversation with other like-minded progressive women working across academic disciplines in the years between 1925 and 1968. Securing copyright for materials published in journal articles is time-consuming and frustrating, and is really going to limit the content that we can include in this volume. And there's just a snapshot of some of the chapters. By way of conclusion, because small feminist publishing platforms like Fembot, Reanimate, and all those that have gone before us were committed to experimentation, we've operated collaboratively and at the margins of open access publishing. Ours has always been a hand-to-mouth existence that depended on very modest funding, mainly for graduate student assistance from the University of Oregon and Bowling Green State University, as well as a lot of labor from faculty and graduate students who cared a lot about the project. Because we were not invested in building an institution or a brand, one of the things we learned from these experiences is that while a journal like Ada may not last beyond 16 to 20 issues, maybe that's enough. We've seen a number of our innovations adopted across fields of academic publishing, um, and we can only speculate about the ripples and, and currents um, that we've created that, that might last beyond the journal itself. Maybe the emphasis on longevity is ironically short-sighted and not conducive to innovation, especially if the goal of a project isn't legacy or institution building, but rather a commitment to making scholarship accessible to anyone with, an internet, with internet access. There's much to be said for experiments like FemBot, FemTechNet, and Catalyst, that aren't invested in creating institutions or even penetrating existing institutions, but that want to do a kind of nimble, innovative DIY work that gives authors control over their scholarship, while at the same time making that scholarship accessible to broader, to broader audiences than ever before. Um, thank you so much for listening to me. Stay well.